Hey everyone, today we're going to continue reading Justine by Marquis de Sade. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at kind of the last little bit of Justine as Justine's basically running back into a few characters that she's run into before and that have abused her to various extents. And he's kind of culminating all the stuff that he's been talking about thus far and taking libertinism to its absolute limit, taking pleasure to its absolute limit, taking sex to its absolute limit. And by doing this, he's particularly focused on making a commentary on what it means to be human. He's trying to dispel with what he sees as mere conventions of humans trying to get along with each other, or at least that's the pretext for things like virtue, whereas Sad is trying to show how in actuality these conditions for existence actually also serve as conditions for manipulation and oppression, and that by basically lambasting virtue in the character of Justine and Therese in this novel, what he's doing is trying to dispel with the notion that virtue will be rewarded. Instead, he tries to found his theory of morality on a sort of openness and negligence to humans that is bestowed by nature, and that nature has, and kind of uses this appeal to nature to ground or rather make acceptable a sort of radical transgression unlike anything you will ever read. Now it's no secret that the Marquis du Sade loves to play with sex. He loves to talk about various sexual exploits, and will take this to the most absurd degrees possible. And this is the point. By taking these acts to the limit, he gets us to a point where pleasure sort of breaks down as being something derivative of an act in order to try to find the ecstasy of pleasure and sensation itself. So, for example, Roland is a character that Therese has run into before, and he tortured her in various ways, and she basically ends up back in the hands of Roland, and Roland has this great dungeon where he's been putting his sister, as well as Therese, and I think four other girls, just constantly through the ringer of torturing them in various ways, and he's killed one of the girls already and basically put her in a coffin and whatnot. And at one point, Roland basically has all of the money he could need by doing this counterfeit currency business that he does across the border, such that it's difficult to nail down and difficult to incriminate. And Roland has everything that he needs, but he's a little bit worried that if he gets caught, he's going to have to be hung. Now, Roland says that he's not really worried about dying as such. He's worried about the pain that's associated with it and that he won't be able to find some pleasure in it. So he does a game that he's been doing with Therese, but he asks for it to be done on him. Now, what he had been doing with Therese is basically this sort of game of teaching Therese that her fate is in her hands, that she needs to use her cunning and her awareness in order to save herself, um, and he basically has a rope in the middle of the room tied to the ceiling, has a chair under that, and has her stand on the chair and the rope around her neck, and attached to the chair is a string such that Roland will pull the chair out from under her and she has to cut the rope at the right time such that she can save herself in this kind of 
teaches her a lesson about um, basically learning to be selfish. And of course, Sad is trying to say that, well, being selfish is actually how our morality works. And that one needs to, at the very least, be aware of this. But Sad is going to go on, of course, to valorize this. Now, for Roland, he wants her to pull out this chair from under him. And he wants to see whether or not he will find some pleasure in this pain of being hung, and particularly if he can find sexual pleasure in the form of giving him an erection. And Therese is like, okay, well, this probably isn't going to do anything. And Roland tells Therese she either needs to leave him there if she sees him get an erection, or if she doesn't see anything happening, she needs to cut him down immediately so that he can figure out um, if he can derive some pleasure from this. And in traditional sad fashion, he experiences the most ecstatic pleasure ever. He immediately um, gets an erection and ejaculates everywhere. And sad paints this in very graphic and very extreme ways. But in doing this, Sad is getting at something very particular that Georges Bataille is also trying to get at. And Bataille was particularly fascinated by this look of ecstasy that is on Chinese and Korean people who were engaged in this ritual practice of Lingxi. And Lingxi was a form of torture, and you can look up Bataille Lingxi, and you'll eventually find this very famous picture that Bataille actually had hung up on his wall, and he would just stare at it all the time. And I'll explain to you what Lingxi is before I, you know, jump the gun. Basically, people who had been condemned of really hard crimes, um, really extreme crimes, would be put in a public square and they would be tied with their hands behind their backs on this pole and their flesh would slowly be cut off of them and they would cut parts of the breast off, parts of the thighs, parts of the shoulders. Slowly they would basically, you know, cut them and dice them into pieces until they died. And there's a very famous picture of this man. Um, no one really knows who took it or who the man is in the picture. Um, but Bataille was just, there was something so fascinating about him for Bataille. And I think I at least share a little bit of there's this man who is being lynched. <laughs> His breasts have been cut such that you can see his ribs and his fronts of his thighs have been cut off. One of his arms up to the elbow is cut off. And yet if you look at the facial expression of the man, you see what seems to be this face of pure ecstasy. His head is lifted up towards the sky and he's smiling. And, you know, you don't really know what to make of that. But what Bataille was interested in is the fact that death creates this sort of unity between ecstasy and pleasure, and, you know, all of this comes together. And there's actually a funny little French phrase, petit mot, which is a f kind of a slang term in French for an ejaculation or, you know, sexual climax. But it literally means little death. So, right, there's, there's something about sexual pleasure that, taken to these extremes, you know, it suspends being categorized in any way and becomes this mere ecstatic suppression of the ability to act any other way. It is sort of a being forced to relegate one's senses to the pure moment. And I think that's what Sad is trying to get at. By taking these sexual acts to the very extremes, what he does is forces us to really look at pleasure as just pure sensation 
and that at the limits of pain, these sensations too can lead to the sort of unique pleasure of being reduced to a mere moment that one cannot escape, being trapped like a black hole. And carrying on, Roland basically has this argument with Therese, and Therese cries, but religion, monsieur, charity, humanity, are the stumbling box to, blocks to any pretense to happiness, said Roland. So he just retorts that. If I have consolidated my own happiness, it is only on the ruins of all those vile, antiquated notions of man. It is by deriding laws, both human and divine, by always sacrificing the weak when I found them in my way, by taking unfair advantage of public good faith, by ruining the poor and stealing from the rich that I have scaled the dizzy heights to the temple of the divinity that I worshipped. Why have you not done likewise? The narrow path to this temple lay before your eyes as it did mine. Have those fanciful virtues that you preferred to it consoled you for your sacrifices? Your time has come, wretch. Your time is nigh. Mourn your errors. Suffer. And if you can, try to find amongst the phantoms you revere those things that your worship of them caused you to lose. So, right, he's saying that her religious devotion has basically acted as a seal, keeping her from transgressing, keeping her from exercising this sort of intoxicating autonomy. And Roland just takes this to crazy extreme degrees, for example, um, where he's about to go on a trip, and as he's about to leave, he shoots his sister in the head to test out his guns and says, take that whore, blowing her brains out, Go tell the devil that Roland, the richest villain on earth, is the man who most insolently challenges the hand of God and his own. So, right, he's challenging the hand of God, the notion of this benevolence that is keeping vice in check. But he also questions his own almost by violating himself, by violating those organizing principles of society that say you must stop at such and such a point. And in so doing, I think Sad is daring us to act differently. And I'm not going to sit here and valorize this behavior. I just think it's important to think about the ways that Sad is explicating these. Now, in terms of talking about his ethical theory in a little bit more detail, Saad has this theory of the main road. And the main road is basically this natural equilibrium of chaos and stability that nature is able to keep. And this is one of my problems with Saad is, and I said this in my last lecture, that Sad basically retains some of these Christian notions of the omnipotence and omniscience of God and just transplants that onto nature with a capital N. He says that nature is just naturally going to maintain this equilibrium. And in a sense, I think he's trying to express this sort of Dionysian element of nature that... Nietzsche loved so much. That's why he was talking about preaching of the earth all the time, because the earth will basically take our tablets of values and raise them to the ground, so to speak. It, you know, nature is rather indifferent, as he says as much on page 220. He uses that very word, indifferent, to describe nature. And Sad just kind of assumes that there's this perfect equilibrium between chaos and stability and he says that throughout to try to transgress this equilibrium isn't going to work that nature is more powerful that it's going to subdue your abilities for example to try to revert to reduce it to pure virtue to try to you know maybe this is expanding lifespan or trying to find some rule of law such that there's no more crime. 
Sad would see these as ways to try to blot out the chaos that is inherent to life and that gives it the potential for experimentation and transgression and autonomy that is so critical to his philosophy. And as a result, he wants to try to find a way to approach these customs that are trying to, you know, reduce humans to pure virtue or pure stability, for example, and find ways to transgress them. And as he said before, risk going back to that state of nature Hobbes was so afraid of in the hopes that maybe someone will be able to experience something truly ecstatic. And Sad says here on page 220, for virtue like vice is merely one way of behaving in the world. Therefore, it's not a question of following one path rather than the other. You just need to walk on the main road. And this is a strange part of Sad's philosophy, where sometimes Sad has these moments where he's like, okay, if the world is just material, then... You just have different things moving in different ways, different things exciting other things to move and change in certain ways, and as such, there's an equality of all actions. Vice is not better than virtue, and virtue is not better than vice. They're just kind of, they're just kind of there. But then, of course, Sad attaches some helpfulness to vice because human society is bent on trying to prioritize virtue and maybe for Saad try to treat it as more important than it actually is. So for Saad, vice and debauchery sort of acts as a balancing factor to try to get us back in touch with something we're maybe losing. He talks about, for example, um, a few pages earlier, that several cultures throughout history, even most cultures, have in you know, endorsed various practices. Um, the translator or noter here mentions sati, which is a an Indian tradition of a wife who basically, her husband has died. She's supposed to throw herself onto his funeral pyre and burn herself. So there's all these various practices that entertain death, that entertain suffering, for example, and Saad just kind of thinks we're trying to blot that out a little bit. So I think that's his motivation behind this. But given that he finds this equality in action, that it's not a question of following one path or another, that really ultimately there are no moral imperatives, there's just, you know, various customs, it seems strange and it seems rather unjustifiable for him to say you just need to walk on the main road. Where is he getting this notion of need from? Maybe need in the sense of your freedom. Maybe that's the way he could use it. But again, this attaches some moral significance to freedom, which it's difficult for Saad to really uphold in a moral sense. I think it would be better if Saad just left it at, as, you know, in the mouth of his characters of this makes me happy. And if I was in a different situation, you know, if if I was suffering, then maybe I wouldn't win it anymore. But since I, that being one of his characters, is on the side of being able to inflict the suffering, then they like it. So it seems a little difficult for him to be able to justify actually staying on that main road, maintaining that equilibrium as if we owed it to nature. And I think that's a problem that remains throughout his philosophy is giving to nature what is owed, whereas I'm not sure where he gets that imperative from. He says, in a world that is entirely virtuous, I would recommend virtue to you, because since rewards are associated with it, happiness would unfailingly depend upon it. In a thoroughly corrupt world, I would only ever recommend vice to you. So right, he's he's kind of saying that if everywhere you've got vice, you might as well partake in vice. That he doesn't understand, or not that he doesn't understand, he simply can't imagine how you could justify going against the grain in a homogenous society if your only possibility was vice, then why would you do otherwise for him? 
But he continues, Now how can those who are perpetually acting against the interests of others expect to be happy? Will you tell me that it is vice that is not in men's interests? I would grant you that in a world made up in equal parts of good and evil, because then the interests of one group would clearly go against those of the other. But this is no longer the case in a totally corrupt society. Therefore, my vices offend against the depraved alone, inspiring in him other vices that compensate him for them, and we are both happy. The tremors are felt by everyone. There is a multiplicity of shocks and mutual injuries whereby, each one immediately regaining what he has just lost, he constantly finds himself in a happy situation. Vice is dangerous only to that virtue which, being weak and timid, never dares to try anything out. But when it no longer exists on earth, when its fastidious reign is over, then vice that offends only the depraved will give birth to other vices, but will corrupt no more virtues. How could you not have come to grief a thousand times in your life, Therese, by constantly going in the opposite direction to that followed by everyone else? If you had gone with the flow, you would have safely entered port like me. Will he who tries to go upriver cover as much distance in the same day as he who goes downstream? You speak to me all the time of providence. Well, how do you know that this providence loves order and consequently virtue? Does she not ceaselessly offer you examples of its injustices and irregularities? Is it in sending men war, plague, and famine? Is it in creating a world that is thoroughly depraved that she manifests her absolute love of good in your eyes? Why do you imagine that depraved individuals displease her, since she manifests herself through vice alone, since everything in her works is vice and corruption, since she wills nothing but crime and disorder? Moreover, where do we get those impulses from that draw us to evil? Is it not her hand that gives them to us? Is there a single one of our sensations that does not come from her, a single one of our desires that is not her work? Is it then reasonable to say that she would allow us inclinations towards something that would harm her or would be of no use to her? Therefore, if vices serve her purpose, why would we wish to resist it? By what right would we work to destroy it, and on what basis would we stifle its voice? A little more philosophy in the world would soon restore order everywhere, and would make magistrates and legislators realize that those crimes they censure and punish with so much severity are sometimes far more useful than the virtues they preach, without practicing them themselves, and without ever rewarding them. So Sad says here, and he said this throughout, that it is constantly supposed that God gives virtue, for example, that God privileges virtue. And Sad is here pointing out that, in fact, if we look at the way that nature bestows all sorts of cataclysmic events, it is actually the case that nature's hand is shown the most in its most tragic events. And this really hints at what Sad is trying to say about nature, namely that it is this Dionysian sort of destructive force, much like the war machine for Jeux de Luz and Félix Quattari, if you know them at all. I have, I've done a lecture on the war machine, if you kind of want a, a little hint about what that is. And again, it's not too dissimilar from what I've been saying about Nietzsche's regards of the earth so far that the earth is able to destroy our values and our sense of security in order to ensure that things change, that things come about anew, that continents shift, that volcanoes erupt and recede away and whatnot. So nature is this great equalizer insofar as it makes things equally changing, equally different, equally new, perhaps, equally, you know, whatever you want to call it, equally transgressive to an order that we like to supplant upon it. 
And as such, really this is sad just telling us to experiment, to partake. He mentions that, you know, that virtue which being weak and timid never dares to try anything out. Right? So virtue is too skittish sometimes. And one may retort to this, and I think very rightly so. What about remorse? You know, even if you can commit all these horrendous acts that Saad flirts with, how can we get rid of remorse? That remorse is a very real thing that we must cope with, and that that, in fact, limits this absolute pleasure that is in crime and debauchery and transgression. And at this moment in the story, Therese is speaking to Dubois now, who is the lady that broke her out of the conciergerie earlier, like at the very, very beginning of the book. And Dubois says, remorse is an illusion. It is nothing, my dear Therese, but the imbecilic murmuring of the soul that is too timid to dare to suppress it. And this is interesting because, you know, Saad telling you to suppress something is quite weird because it almost goes contrary to his sort of libertarian, uh, libertine notions of just absolute freedom. So to be more specific, he writes here, and this is on page 221, Practice more often what makes you feel remorse, and you will soon be rid of it. Counter it with the flame of the passions and the powerful laws of self-interest, and you will soon have dispelled it. Remorse is not proof of crime. It is merely evidence of a mind that is easy to subjugate. So we see here that what Sad is doing is actually rather significant insofar as as it is a sort of genealogy of morals in which he's looking at the ways in which remorse is not a phenomenon as such, but a trained phenomenon. It is a sort of instance of classical conditioning in which we are told to have remorse for something because, you know, we want to be a good boy to society or we want to please people or, you know, whatever it may be. So, you know, one can imagine being at least this possibility of being in a state in nature in which you don't have the luxury of having remorse all the time in films, right? Someone has to make some decision that they didn't want to make, but they have to, um, I don't know, kill their comrade or whatever in order to survive, in order that they might live long enough for a rescue ship to come and save them on the life raft or whatever. So, right, in these situations of struggle, remorse is not an issue, right? Because in those situations of struggle, Sad tries to point out that that is when we are the closest to the state that nature has naturally placed us in. That's when we are closest to nature and we're closest to our nature, which is self-interest, which is acting for our needs because the preservation of ourselves is the most prescient concern of ours. And as such, when he says that remorse is not a proof of a crime, it's merely evidence of a mind that is easy to subjugate, he's kind of poking at Therese and the virtue that she stands for, the Christian morality that she stands for, to say that, look, you like to talk of remorse as if that makes something a crime, but in fact, that remorse the more someone has it, it just shows the more willing they are to accept orders, to accept moral instruction, and that it doesn't tell us anything about the actual moral quality of the act in and of itself, but only the moral act and the moral quality of the act in a social system. And this leads, sad, to moral relativism, just plain up. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way, because I think it's very hard to, you know, actually ground some sort of objective ethics. I ultimately don't think you can do it. But this is just kind of the classic statement of moral relativism. This is here on page 222. One must begin with a precise analysis of everything men call crime, 
in order to persuade oneself that it is nothing but the infringement of their laws and their national customs. That what one calls crime in France ceases to be such 200 leagues away. That there is no act that is really considered as a crime all over the world. None that, debauched or criminal here, is not virtuous and praiseworthy a few miles from here that all is a matter of opinion and of geography, and that it is therefore absurd to wish to compel oneself to practice virtues that are nothing but vices elsewhere, and to shun crimes that are excellent actions in another climate. Given these reflections, I ask you now whether I can still feel any remorse for having committed in France, whether out of pleasure or interest, a crime that is quite simply a virtue in China, or whether I should make myself most unhappy and inconvenience myself greatly in order to carry out in France acts that would get me burnt in Siam. And this notion that everything is a matter of opinion and geography, you know, this is one of the most salient critiques that one can make when they say, oh, we should, you know, we should give zakat, right? It's Ramadan right now. Zakat is charity and it's a fundamental pillar of islam someone just sent me a, an islamic society just sent me an email asking if i wanted to give zakat and i was like no you know i'm too poor or whatever but really i could just recourse to sad here and say well why should i give zakat it's ultimately a matter of opinion of geography it's certainly the case that if we were all in a way worse situation, we probably wouldn't be asking for a zakat. And all the time, you know, you'll have videos of, oh, there's people in these hardships, and still they hold on to, you know, their faith, for example, in Palestine right now, and that's great. Like, I love that they've, I love that they've got something to kind of keep them grounded, but Sad's trying to show, for example, in this, how Therese slowly gets worn down from constantly being berated and eventually reaches this point where she must simply become more self-interested. She must realize that, oh, sometimes she just has to engage in debauchery because she's put in these situations where she has no other choice. And she slowly learns to feel less and less remorse because she always kind of has this, this gut reaction to go back to religion and you know, when she's in a good situation, she thanks God. When she's in a bad situation, she sometimes questions God or gets concerned. But then she's like, oh no, this was Providence's desire for me. This is what God wanted for me. I should have no reason to be upset. So, right, it's this kind of unfalsifiable knee-jerk reaction to sort of find a little light in the darkness that is heard, you know, the circumstances that she's in and as such she learns to kind of have that recourse and because she has that in the back of her mind it almost acts as a crutch to the necessary debauchery that she has to engage in it gives her a sense of security and grounding such that you know she will start to become accustomed to the schedules of the debauchery, you know, she'll have to do such and such every day to satisfy such and such libertine character in this novel. And as such, Sad culminates here with probably one of the most quotable things for Sad. As there is no real crime against anything, it is stupid to repent of it. And pusillanimous to dare to do only what can be useful or agreeable to us, whatever the obstacles that must be overcome to achieve it. So, right, this is moral nihilism. As there is no real crime against anything. Crime is not real with the capital R. It's not true with the capital T. It's not universal. It's not absolute with the capital A. It's opinion and geography, right? So really, Sad is trying to poke a hole in this notion that 
humans' concepts are actually concurrent with nature's doings. He's trying to show how our impositions on nature ultimately will not succeed, and thus all of the acts that he makes Therese and Justine undertake. So I hope this has been useful for understanding Saad's philosophy. Check out some of the other lectures I've done on this work if you've got any questions. Um, check out any of my other lectures that I've done on postmodernism, German idealism, gender theory, other literature. Become a channel member for $5 a month and join a private philosophy Zoom I do once a month. That's it, and I'll see you in another lecture.